This is a sermon by Bishop Gregory Brewer of the Episcopal Diocese of Central Florida at Holy Cross Episcopal Church, Sanford, Florida, July 21st, 2013. The point Jesus is making in the Gospel reading is, and it was scandalous, you need to know what happened, that he would suggest that, of a woman, is that Jesus is collecting with his disciples they are sitting at the feet of their rabbi who is teaching them, all appropriate, except that it's a men-only crowd. What do the women should be doing? They should be in the kitchen getting ready for the meal after the teaching's over. That's exactly what Martha is doing. And she's mad as a hornet that Mary isn't in there with her. What's Mary doing? She literally, and the Greek's very specific, she sits herself down, it says to sit down with the rest of the men who are there listening to Jesus. Of course, everybody expects Jesus to say something like, don't you have a job to do? Jesus doesn't say a word. He continues right on teaching. And you can see Martha sort of flitting around the edges, sort of giving Mary the evil eye, like, what are you doing? Get up. Have you ever had somebody look at you like that and know they're trying to communicate something? That's what's going on here. And finally, it just, the anger gets the better of her. And she gets, she goes to Jesus and she says, in essence, Jesus, she's not doing what she's supposed to be doing. I'm out here all by myself. And Jesus says something really astonishing. He says to Martha, Mary, in fact, right now, is doing the better thing. And there's a double entendre, actually, in the Greek, where he says, Jesus, Jesus says, Mary has chosen the better portion. Actually, you could read that, since Martha is getting the meal ready, for Jesus to be saying, Martha actually is getting the better food. And it will not be taken away from her. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I really like to be busy. In fact, it is actually shown, I posted this one time on my Twitter feed, that people who are called in the ordained ministry typically fall into two different camps. Either they're lazy or they're driven. And then the punchline in the feed was, it's very helpful to know which propensity is yours. Well, I know what mine is. I'm a guy who keeps a list. I have things to do. I have telephone calls to return and emails to finish. I've got appointments going on. And it's really actually almost ADD difficult for me to sit down <laughs> and just read or anything like it. And actually enjoy reading. But I really do prefer to be busy. So for me to hear the Mary Martha story is not an easy thing for me to hear. Why? Because what I do is that I hear it as a reprimand. You should be praying more. <clears throat> that really actually doesn't motivate me very much. <laughs> not in a way that actually invites me to change my behavior. I'll feel appropriately guilty because I know it's true. But will it actually cost me to change my behavior? No. Usually, you must, even from a bishop, doesn't do a lot to change the situation. I, I know that. So it's actually more helpful, it seems to me, for me to look at the why, which is, why do I prefer to be so busy? Why is it difficult for me to sit down and make the time to be still? And I believe that's also in the scriptures. Some of, that, some of it is personality. It is the way we are wired. But that actually doesn't let us off the hook. We who like to be busy. We who are not naturally contemplative. We who can have at times, can I be really honest with you? We who sometimes find prayer boring, right? Not your head, let's be real with each other. <laughs> so the question becomes, how do I get past that? And I think it has everything to do 
with an understanding, gaining a better understanding, and actually asking God to help us with this, to gaining a better understanding of to whom we are praying. And that really takes us to the Colossian lesson. Because it seems to me, in this case, this isn't always true, but in this case, epistle and gospel are two sides of the same coin. Would you look in your leaflet to the Colossian lesson for a minute? Paul really does say some quite astonishing things about Jesus. And I think they get at some of the things that happen inside of us that make us make it difficult for us to actually sit down and talk to God, to make the time to pray, to respond, as you saw in the children's sermon, to, in essence, the hook of Christ, calling us away from our busyness to make the time to sit and be still. We could just as easily have had somebody, oh, what do I do? I like to watch the TV, turn off the TV. What is it I like to do? Oh, I love to do email and sit at the computer. Shut down the computer for a minute, or at least put it in sleep mode. Turn off the iPhone. It could be any of the things that cause us to be so distracted that even if we do make the time to sit down, our brain is automatically going to something else rather than making the time to pray. I think it has everything to do in part with how we think we relate to him, or maybe even more accurately, how we think he relates to us. For example, if I think that there is something that God is holding against me, if I wrestle with condemnation, guilt, sin, which is probably at least, oh, 95% of the people in the room and the other 5% are lying. <laughs> How do we deal with that when it comes to prayer? Because if we think somehow that who Jesus is, is somebody who, when we go to him, is going to say, how come you haven't dealt with this yet? Then the last thing I'm going to want to do is go talk to him, right? I don't need anybody to remind me of my sin. I do a pretty good job of that myself. But notice what it says in Colossians. If you look down, let's see, let me make sure I find it. About a third of the way down, the sentence that begins dead in the middle, and you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, notice, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to do what? To present you holy, blameless, and irreproachable before him. In other words, what Paul is saying about this, in this very instance that we're describing, that when we come to Jesus in prayer, the last thing he's interested in doing is reminding us of all the places that we've done wrong. That's actually not particularly important. He, he knows it, of course. He, in fact, he knows us perfectly. But also what he sees in us it's not merely the sin and protection and the things that are going wrong. He also sees what he has planted inside of us, his own nature. To them, notice at the bottom, to them God has chosen, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are what the riches of the glory of his mystery, which is what Christ in you, the hope of glory, so that what Jesus sees shining in our hearts in a way that we often do not see is Christ, his own reflection, the nature of what he has put in us. The thing that we often do not see because we are distracted and busy, prone to shame and condemnation, doing our best to try to get ahead and work really hard, living up to so many people's expectations, not the least of which is our own, and so we're driven. But what Jesus wants to do is say, no, 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 there's something else that's far bigger than your drivenness. There's something that in fact defines you in my sight, and it's not your accumulated good or bad behavior. 
Jesus is not, as I've said, Santa Claus in the sky who's making a list and checking it twice. Instead, he is the one, as the scripture says, who is profoundly for us. If God be for us, who can be against us? And so that when we come to him, the first thing he sees, the first thing he sees is what he has planted in us. His own love, his own power, his own forgiveness, his own grace, his own wisdom, his own mercy. The very same spirit, Paul says in Romans 9, which raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, in me. And that's what he sees. And if I know that who's in whose presence I am coming is not someone even if I be the woman caught in adultery, is not someone who will stand and say, boy, am I ready to cast some stones against you this morning. But instead, sees what he has planted in me and invites me to come into what? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And what? I will give you rest. That's what he wants. He wants to pour in us the very things that we need that we cannot give ourselves. Because if I'm full of drivenness, the last thing I can do is give myself the kind of inner restoration that I so desperately need. What does it say in Psalm 23? He restores my soul. In other words, how you see Christ has everything to do with whether or not you want to be with him or not. And we could do, which we won't, literally an entire day of working through this passage in Colossians. That we'll, and I believe this is a part of what Paul is doing, is laying before the Colossian people the very supremacy of who Christ Jesus is as a way to say to them, why in the world would you ever want to go anywhere else? Now for Paul, the issue is other religions. But it also applies here that in the midst of all of the many places we can go and things we can do, why would you want to go anywhere else? It's not that doing isn't important. This parable follows the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is all about going and doing. Jesus is not against servanthood and leadership as a servant and making a difference in, in our society, caring for the people that we know and love, but he is also juxtaposing these together as a way to say, if you really want to be out there, which I would like you to do, Jesus is saying, you must Make the time to be with me. Otherwise, to use a contemporary phrase, you will burn out. It is actually to the busy, those who really want to make a difference, that Jesus says most tenderly, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So the message of this sermon today is, in the midst of the many things that you are doing, whether it be baseball or whether it be making a difference in your community, serving people at the dinner table, opening a shelter for the homeless to feed them, making the time to catch up with people you love and care about on the phone. How are you doing? Jesus saying, in the midst of all of those very good things, he says, come and be with me. And in so doing, we will experience in us the power and the grace that we need to get out there and do, and do well. In a way that isn't coercive and demanding like Martha, but instead really does reflect the grace, the poise, the winsomeness, 
and the gentle determination that flows from the very Spirit of Jesus. You see, that's, those are only things that He can give us. So, we're, so that wherever we are, there's something about us that has the very presence of Christ. And that is what He has placed within us. And to be alone with Him is to release that. So that as we serve, what people experience is not just us working hard. But they begin to experience, even in very small ways, the presence of Jesus flowing through what it is that we do. And that's our job description. That's the call of the church. To be men and women who are serving, caring, giving, making a difference in the church, in the community. But doing so out of the resources that only God can give. And those come by being with Him. Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, we do thank you that we can come to you as we are, even weary, heavy laden, burdened, filled with condemnation and shame, or just worn out. And as we come to you, Lord, we do ask that you would receive us just as we are, because it's the only way we know how to come. And that you would give and pour out upon us that which we could never give ourselves, that which we could never do for ourselves, which is your restoration. Hope. The hope of glory, even as the scripture says. So Lord, we do give ourselves to you. That we might be graced, refreshed, and empowered to serve with your love and grace. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. P.S. Last Thursday, I was uh, called by Governor Rick Scott's office to participate in a conference call uh, the next day, Friday, two days ago. It really wasn't a conference call. That, that inflated my pride. It was really just an announcement. But as you know, because it's been in the news, Governor Scott has called us to pray today for civic unity. And so I did not want to let this day go by by making sure that we do that, especially here with the burden that you all have carried in this community. And so I do not think it is coincidental that in the midst of the many places that I could have gone today, it would be arranged months ago that I be here. Because I want you to know that, number one, I care about what happens here. And that means I care about Holy Cross Church. And the last thing in the midst of the whirlwind of activity and the whirlwind of competing voices and the whirlwind of all that is going on, you all would somehow get lost in the shuffle. You all are, in fact, men and women who care deeply about each other. You care about this community. And you are people of prayer. So that more than any to whom I could give the sermon I just gave, I was excited to be able to share it with you. Because in you, you are people who need that kind of grace and refreshment. And when it comes time in our intercessions, you will hear me offer a prayer for this church and for this community as we honor Governor Scott's call. Thank you.